Hi, everybody. Happy Women's History Month. I'm April Allen, and my gender pronouns are she and her. I'm the System Director of the Center of Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access here at Peace Health. We've had a fantastic month celebrating women's history, and I couldn't be more excited to wrap it up this week with all of you. This month's theme is a special one to me personally and our Peace Health community too. We're highlighting women, uh, providing healing and promoting hope. Selected by the National Women's History Alliance, this theme is a tribute to the ceaseless work of caregivers and frontline workers during this ongoing pandemic, and also a recognition of the thousands of ways that women of all cultures have provided both healing and hope throughout history. Joining me to celebrate this moment is an incredible woman whose life's work and journey has been dedicated to providing healing for all, Dr. Elizabeth Burns. Hi, Dr. Burns. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I'm excited. Dr. Burns is the uh, Chief Medical Officer at Signature Healthcare at Home. With over 22 years of clinical and executive leadership in healthcare, Dr. Burns specializes in advancing the care delivery model in the home. Prior to joining Signature, she was the first chief medical officer for Avamir Family of Companies during the onset of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Everybody hold on to your seats. This is, she is, has an impressive resume. Dr. Burns led the organization in developing a progressive COVID-19 strategy and best practices in protecting the most vulnerable populations. During this time, Dr. Burns was instrumental to the Oregon governor's office and worked closely with the OHA, Oregon Health Authority, Oregon Healthcare Association and Center of Disease and Prevention, CDC. Dr. Burns developed numerous COVID-19 response and recovery units throughout the state of Oregon, in addition to a community monoclonal antibody clinic in partnership with OHA and the Oregon Department of Human Services, which allowed access for all Oregonians to life-saving therapy. Dr. Burns currently sits on the board of directors for Base 10 Genetics and has been honored by the Oregon Healthcare Association for her contributions to the state of Oregon in the COVID-19 response and recovery with a special services award. Woo, I got that out, Dr. Burns. <laughs> thank you for joining us. We are honored to have you. Feel free to take it away. Well, thank you, April, and what a nice introduction. And good afternoon to everybody who's joined the call. Uh, first, I wanna thank you for inviting me today and for everybody who took time to come to this call. It's truly an honor to be able to recognize and amplify the millions of women in healthcare who've carried us through one of the most challenging times in our lives as a nation, in our work, and at homes, and in our community. And as a physician, I was really excited to see that the, that the national theme for Women's History Month is really centered around frontline women who have put their lives on the line while extending hearts and hands to the care of our community. And while many people were able to transition into remote work during the pandemic, right? If they were safe in their homes and with their family and supporting their kids, our frontline staff ran into this crisis. Many of you who are on the call today, you know this all very well. It was a really a rally call to our profession. And while stepping up and rising to the occasion, the reality is there's never been a, repeat, a reprieve from the daily stress and strain and exhaustion navigating these uncharted waters in every aspect of patient care over the years. For most of you on this call, you know this has been a marathon of sprints, and I wanna to continue to thank you for shining the light of hope and healing over the course of the last two years. So my journey of understanding this incredible task of how women really have been providing healing and hope during the pandemic was a bit serendipitous. So my background, as April mentioned, I'm a hospitalist. I'm a single mom, I work nights most of my career so I could be home with my kids during the day, like many of you, I'm sure. When I hit my mid forties, I couldn't sleep. And so I transitioned into an administrative role for about six years on the health plan side but I was really longing to get back into the provider space uh, where my, my heart and my passion truly reside. I tell you this because it was right at the beginning of January of 2020, and I was interviewing at Avamir, which is a post-acute and senior uh, care continuum, and I was sitting in the office of the CEO, Rick Miller, 
when he asked me what I thought about this virus that was emerging in China, and it was really hot off the press, and we sat in his office, and we talked about various scenarios and possibilities, just really based on very limited information that we had. And little did we know in a few weeks, I think it was January 20th of 2020, the first case would be identified in the state of Washington. Fast forward, February 29th was leap year. A nursing home in Washington became the first casualty of the ravages of COVID. It would be 39 deaths in the coming weeks. Hospitals and senior care were now thrown into this new reality. And I think most of us on this call remember that day. There was this impeding sense of uneasiness that we all felt, and we knew it was a matter of time before we were all faced with a similar scenario in the days, weeks, months, and unfortunately, we've experienced within those two years. Stepping in the role at the beginning of the pandemic, it was clear that our patients were some of the most vulnerable populations that would be impacted by the pandemic and that the hospital and post-acute care staff would be and continue to bear the brunt of this pandemic. So in so many ways, I am honored that I was able to be a part of, bear witness, echo, amplify, and learn from you, you women in the field, on the front lines, behind the scenes, the voices, the thoughts that you were seeing. You were the healers, you were the caregivers. You have brought a priceless gift to your patients, their families, to your colleagues and community. You are nurses, caregivers, therapists, chaplains, dentists, hygienists, doctors, pharmacists, and I'm sure I'm missing many others. But let's not forget, you're also our mothers, our grandmothers, our daughters, our sisters, our friends, and our neighbors coming together and listening and learning from each other, easing suffering, restoring dignity, and leading with compassion and empathy while providing hope and healing. So Women's History Month. Do you wanna go to the next slide? Why do we celebrate? So most of the time, history has really been his story. Over the years, much of history has been written by men, about men, and for men, and in fact, 50% of the population in the world is women, yet about less than 1% of written history is about women. From our founding fathers to inventors, civil rights leaders, the story is truly his. And for every history-making man, there is another history-making woman. In March of 1982, America celebrated its first History Week, which later became History Month. And in honor of this year's Women in History Month, focusing on women on the front line, Let's first remember those who came before us. I'm sure everybody remembers the name Florence Nightingale. She led the charge for healthcare reform by improving unsanitary hospitals. Clara Barton is probably one of the most recognized heroes of the American Civil War. And she had a lasting impact on caregiving and disaster relief in America by establishing the American Red Cross. Do many of you know Dr. Eliza Ann Greer? She was an emancipated slave who faced racial discrimination and financial hardship while pursuing her dream of becoming a doctor. In order to pay for her education, she alternated every year of her studies with a year of picking cotton. It took her seven years to graduate. And in 1989, she became the first black woman licensed to practice medicine in the state of Georgia and advanced the care for women of children and color. And then there's Dr. Antonia Novella. She was born in Puerto Rico. She's the first female Surgeon General in the United States and spent her life advancing healthcare for minorities, women, and children. Over the past 100 years, traditionally, women played a supporting role in the labor force due to cultural and societal norms. If you wanna to go to the next slide, we can take a look at that. And over the years, these roles continue to evolve. We start to see the gender stereotypes evolving with more men entering the field traditionally held by women, including healthcare. More men becoming stay-at-home dads or sharing roles with their women counterpart. So a shout out to you men, for you those that are on the call that are here supporting the women in your life. And when we look at the past 40 years, women have dominated the workforce in healthcare. And this is important because the last two years of this pandemic have had a significant impact on women in the workforce at home, physically, socially, and emotionally. And it's obviously had an impact on every human across the globe. 
women account for 50.52% of the population in the U.S. And in 2020, women comprised 50.4% uh, 50 of the workforce. And while women dominated the workforce, I want to acknowledge that 16% of women during this pandemic have reported a loss of income, uh, income or their job due to childcare needs. It has disproportionately affected women in this regard. This is important because healthcare and caring for patients during the global pandemic has been primarily done by women. As you can see on this slide, 78% of all jobs in healthcare are women. That's over 3 million women that provide healthcare across our country. And as you look at the breakdown, you can see most of these roles are traditionally held by women. Physicians and dentists, while they you know, make up about 35 to 30% of the workforce, right now dental schools and medical schools have over 50% of women entering the workforce. This year's theme for National Women's History Month is providing healing and promoting hope. And there's really no better time to acknowledge and pay tribute to the enormous contributions of women in healthcare and caregivers who have provided far more than healing and hope throughout the pandemic as we continue to ride these waves. Go ahead and go to the next slide. As I said in the beginning, this has been a marathon of sprints and we've endured over the last two years, five waves in this pandemic, each different from one another. And the stories from the front line of hope and healing are distinctly unique for these periods of time. Do you wanna to go to the next slide? So what is healing? So I want you guys to think about what healing is, and, and if you don't mind sharing, put your definition of what is healing in the chat box and how you would describe it. You know, I think there's a lot of different ways that healing can be described, and we all have our own definition and need for healing. We often focus in medicine on the process of cure, right? We get the labs, we get the x-rays, we ensure that patients have had their medications, and then when the alarms and the beeping go off in the room and there appears to be a crisis, I always say to myself, okay, we can look at the monitor, but we really have to look at the patient to know what's going on. And so when we strip it all down, to me, healing is the process of care. So April, do you wanna share some of the definitions of um, healing that we're getting in the chat box right now? Sure, can you, can you see me? I can see you, yes. Yes, there you no, go. I can see you. There you are, yep. There you go. Okay, let me look in that chat box for healing. I will say right now I am seeing with healing, I'm going to say my chat is acting a little strange, Dr. Burns, okay. but All right. I, will, I will give you my definition of healing. All right, there you go. So let's go with that. Healing is bringing wholeness. I love that. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and so as, as we go through this presentation and, and this discussion today, I, I would love for feedback and, and people to interact and put your thoughts um, in the box because again, us coming together uh, collectively, it's always interesting to hear different perspectives and stories um, from the front line. And so I'd love for you to share. And April, if anything pops up, feel free to interrupt and, and we can tackle it at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I definitely will. I also see something that says healing means to understand the wounds and grow from them. Mm, that's, that's wonderful. I, I love that. So, you know, when we when we look back, um, you know, at the at the pandemic and we look at the beginning of the pandemic and we think about going through these waves and how our frontline staff have really promoted healing. You know, I think about when I entered in the United States in the state of Washington, and I can remember that day myself, and I'm sure everybody else on this call can too. Our eyes were glued to the TV. We were wondering what this meant from us and hearing different reports, what it would mean personally, professionally, for our kids, for our parents. Frontline staff wondering what risk would come to them if they encountered the virus when we went to work, right? Little was known at that time about transmission and how we could risk mitigate. How would we protect our families from the beginning? I remember that being something that was very concerning to many. Um, and often I would get calls, you know, should I go to work? You know, what's going to happen to my kids? It quickly became apparent that we had a critical shortage of PPE in the beginning. 
in that moment all across healthcare, right? From three ply masks to N95s. And for those of you who are in the hospital setting and in long term care, N95s were very challenging to get. Our sector was heavily impacted, our doors were closed to the public. We were close to family members. We knew that the virus would enter from the outside in, and our staff members were acutely aware of the challenges, and they rose to the occasion. In one of our facilities, in LPN, let's call her Gail, she would probably work about a 40, uh, 40 to 50 hour work week. And then she was gonna go home, and she started sewing cloth masks for staff, for patients, for people in the community, because again, there was a scarcity of PPE. Unable to keep up with the demand, Gail brought her sewing machine to work and she inspired others. And the staff during breaks would go down into the basement and they would learn how to sew these uh, cloth masks for other staff members. And we would transfer them to other facilities and, and to the community and they were free to the public. Um, she even took special requests from seniors based on their hobbies and special interests and posted it on social media. And Gail inspired others across the country to do the same. And then when the shelter in place order went into effect in late March, I'm sure all of us can remember that, frontline workers were now staffed with a new challenge. Um, no one in healthcare, right, that had to be on the front line could really understand what was going to happen next if they had small children at home needing a caregiver. Some families had both parents in frontline jobs and some women are single parents. One of my girlfriends, we'll call her Jenny to protect her privacy, is an ICU nurse in Portland. And she's a single mom of three kids. She has a nine-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 15-year-old. And her family lives back east in New York and her parents are in their late 70s and at the time were high risk. Jenny would not realize that being an ICU nurse would be one of the most impacted floors in the hospital over the course of the next few years and the demand on the staff and the emotional toll that would soon come. But Jenny had a squad of girlfriends in and outside of work and Jenny moved in with her friend that has a child that was working remotely. It was not an easy task but one that many women across the country were faced with on how to take care of patients and their family at the same time. I'm sure many of you have your own story and can relate, and I ask you to share your story with us if you feel free to. So she would work long hours under multiple layers of PPE, caring for the most sick and impacted during the pandemic. She would get pictures from her kids and pictures from her girlfriend, cheering her on and giving her the inspiration for those who needed her care the most. We can then fast forward several months later and the virus is moving more quickly through vulnerable populations. Skilled nursing and hospitals, again, bearing the brunt of the pandemic, doors closed to the public by mandate, family members cannot come in and visit their loved one, not even at that time those that were dying. The staff know that they are the potential source of spread and the weight and the gravity of this is just tremendous. One of our greatest generations is in lockdown. We, like others across the country, have stories of areas where there was high community transmission. And our staff committed to moving in to protect the patients in their care, to be their family, their comfort in time of such uncertainty. And then we also have to recognize that there was a shadow pandemic happening at the same time of isolation and loneliness for the seniors that were in skilled facilities and in assisted living. Our staff had makeshift sleeping areas in the physical therapy gym or in the cafeteria, and they created a sense of family that was already there, but it brought it to a whole new level. It was the longest and largest summer party, probably known to man. And they got creative with playing games and activity, bringing in their mu musical instruments and breaking on spontaneous concert for their patients while keeping them safe and keeping them cared for. They created a network of pen pals from various other nursing homes across the country to share their stories and their lives, keeping them engaged, creating new relationships that were relating with other people that nobody else could understand but them. It stemmed from the love and compassion of these women who set their own lives aside at home to be present to and protect their patient from the greatest threat of COVID. As the months continue to roll on and the waves continue to do the same, you know, healing came from both sides of the equation. 
there was a story that one of our chaplain and the care team told uh, about a patient, and I'll call her Anne to protect her privacy. She was 80 something when uh, the chaplain first met her and she described her as fabulous in one of our meetings. She said she was so glamorous and she was so put together every time that the team would go to see her in her home. But she barely accepted this chaplain uh, when this one young 40 year old woman uh, came in, it, it caught her off guard and her first words, she was ready to kick her out but instead she changed her mind after having a woman walk in, a clergy woman. Her spiritual healing began almost immediately as she talked through the top trauma and her experiences in her younger years in the church. The cancer started to take over and she had shared with the chaplain and the care team a song that she wanted to have at her funeral. It was That'll Do from the movie Babe. Her nurses and her caregivers and the chaplain listened to the song with her over and over again. And the words were, a little courage goes a long, long way. Let's get you a little bit further down the road each day. And before you know it, you'll hear someday, that'll do, babe, that'll do. And while she was in her transitioning state, she was able to wake up enough to say to her team, that'll do, that'll do. I share this story because the team said this really provided them with comfort, her companionship, her wisdom while they were bringing her dignity and spiritual healing during this time of her transition. It allowed them to know that the work that they were doing was meaningful and that their compassion made a difference in her life and the life of others. Just last week, I went out with the hospice team and we were seeing patients. And when I arrived at the facility, I met that same chaplain that I just talked to you about and the hospice nurse. And we started to walk down the hall to see a mutual patient when a massage therapist walked out of the patient's room. And let's call this patient Rose. Even though we're all bundled under our PPE and face masks, we can see that the massage therapist is smiling from ear to ear and her mood is palpable. And she said, I just had the most beautiful moment with Rose. I think she's transitioning. Rose is 87 years old. She had several setbacks in her health over the pandemic and four months prior, she had contracted COVID and just never really recovered. She stopped eating. She did not want any more uh, medical treatment. The massage therapist said that when she was visiting Rose, she could barely communicate, but she just wanted to be held. So the massage therapist was holding her, rocking her back and forth, and Rose really seemed to respond to it. And she said she kept saying this word, ayeti, ayeti, reaching out in front of her as if something was there. Rose was from Finland, and ayeti means mother. I know this because this chaplain that I was with is also Finnish. And so she had shared with the massage therapist and myself what a gift it was to witness someone's transition while providing comfort and healing within the safety as Rose is finding her comfort with a woman, her mother, who brought her into her life and who will also be comforting her during her transition. So we walked into Rose's room and she was laying there peacefully in bed. She was breathing slowly. Occasionally she was opening her eyes to see what was in the room. And I'm so frustrated, right, that we have to still have these masks on, the N95, so people cannot see our faces. They can't read our lips. They can't see our gentle smiles. So we have to use our other senses through touch and sound. We have to communicate with our eyes. And I've watched so many of our frontline workers navigate these, these communications every day so beautifully. Rose continues to call for her mom. At the same time, the nurse calls her daughter to let her know it would be important to come and see Rose today that her body is saying she's ready, she's still awake, and it would be a good time for her to come. You can hear the daughter's hesitation on the other end of the phone. She says, oh, I've got my grandkids here today. I don't think I can make it there. I don't have any gas money to come in. I might come in a couple days. And you can just get a sense that something's not right. So as the nurse continues to talk with her, she said, well, I don't know if you'll have time in the next few days. And if there are some things that you'd like to be able to say to your mom, and if you want to be here while she's still awake, we really think it's important that you come right now. Mom was silent. And then you could hear her crying. She was scared. And then she was upset. 
she communicated that she felt that she was a disappointment to her mother all these years and that her mother had never said the words, I love you. So the Finnish chaplain validated her feelings and asked if her mom showed her love through her actions. She noticed that since she had known Rose for some time now, she had shared all the beautiful stories that her mom spoke of her, how proud she was of her, and that her actions spoke that she truly cared for her. The chaplain shared that growing up, her mother witnessed her culture that never spoke the words, I love you, from her parents or grandparents. And that was a cultural norm and not a reflection of her mother's feelings. And you could hear the 50 years of pain and confusion dissipate in that moment. She thanked the chaplain and the care team because she could never understand as a child or even as an adult how her mom truly felt about her. And she immediately said she would come to see in her her mother. And as Rose was reaching out for her mother, her, her daughter was now reaching out to her. And the care team were wrapping their arms around the entire family and providing healing in all of their life's journey. Next slide. So I'm wondering, for those of you who are on the call, if you could share who somebody, who is somebody in your life that has inspired you by providing healing and promoting hope? Is it something that you've witnessed in, in your job on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it something where you felt really proud of the accomplishments that you had in, in working with one of your patients? I'd love, April, if you'd be able to read some of the inspirational stories we have from some of our frontline uh, workers here on the call today. Okay, it takes a it takes a few seconds to get over to me. But, um, but you know, your stories have been so inspirational. Um, I I actually jotted a few few uh, notes down. Um, so thank you for sharing. But I I will wait to see who uh, some of these stories that should come to me. Um, someone just said uh, my pastor Cindy Baldry has been a beacon of hope during this pandemic. She recognizes how important it is to make space for hurting, which provides space to heal. It's mm, beautiful. That is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Do we have any more April coming in, or we can also read some of those off at the end of the call? If um... yeah, I would I would suggest we do that just because the way we're funneling funneling them to me. So let's let's keep going and we'll read some more. I'm sure there's right. new stories. Um, I have one more before we uh, before we move on. My aunt, she herself is a frontline worker, and she works so hard to take care of her patients, and still has the capacity to take care of our family. Yeah, yeah. We'll keep going, and we'll come back. All right. Thank you for sharing, April. All right. Do you want to go to the next slide? So when the pandemic hit in January of 2020, right, we entered a, this phase, you know, back at the beginning, of trying to understand how we had to quickly assess the threat and the risk to our patients and staff across the company. And also, based on the information, how to instill hope that in the days, months, and weeks ahead, that we'd all be able to walk together through this pandemic safely and effectively. Do we have an understanding of how much PPE how will we train our employees and communicate to our patients? So we rapidly established these COVID calls like many of you on this call I'm sure participated in. It was important for all of us to communicate clearly, effectively, and consistently as news emerged. I was new to my role and I was also new to the industry. And I also did not know anyone in the organization yet. Yet I would be setting the strategy for our COVID response and recovery. And as I presented our leadership calls, I will never forget from the beginning and throughout the entire time during the pandemic, the women in the organization who deliberately and intentionally amplified me and other women. It was the first time I had seen the shine theory of action. And for those of you who aren't aware, the shine theory in action is when you help another woman shine, we all rise. And from my seat, I had this decision-making authority, but I knew it was important to bring diverse backgrounds, perspectives, voices, initiatives, and concerns and solutions to the table. Collectively, we had impact. And I also want to acknowledge the men in the room who supported women 
no matter where we sit in healthcare, from our CNAs to our nurses, to our physicians, our therapists, our collective communities in healthcare, we were all aligned in the face of the unknown, which gave us hope that we would make it through the months ahead. I found my squad of women in my organization. There's a nurse practitioner, I would always call for perspective. She was a fast thinker. She was great at bouncing ideas off of in the moment. She was compassionate in her evaluation and always inserted humor to make it through the toughest of times. I had my girlfriends from medical school, my sister, my mom, my 99-year-old grandma, who I would call up and she's like, ah, oh, Lizzie, you got this. And then of course there were my kids who really provided me with social and emotional support. At work, the frontline staff, they held knowledge. It was a new virus that was rapidly shifting. The nurses and the caregivers at the bedside had the pulse on the pandemic from the science to the humanity and what patients and staff needed. Nobody will ever be able to understand the toll that this virus caused on our workforce and healthcare, the burnout, the fatigue, the trauma, and the moral injury. We are all drawn to this profession to help and care for people. We were all challenged in ways, and especially those on the front line, with making decisions that we were never trained to deal with or could even begin to fathom. We relied on one another in our shared yet unique experience. We helped one another and our patients through the fire with compassion, selflessness, safe spaces to decompress. That's so important for us, right? From either after our Zoom calls to journaling and break rooms, collecting stories of despair and hope throughout the pandemic. We all had to face our own mortality while taking cares of theirs who were confronting theirs. So let's fast forward 11 months into the pandemic, and we're starting to learn a lot more about the virus, the importance of public health measures to protect us from mass to social distancing. And then we had the remarkable gift of science and technology with the hope and the promise of a safe and effective vaccine, one that Dr. Kaznekia Korbeck, an immunologist at Harvard, helped pioneer. The development of life-saving monoclonal antibodies sparked another wave of hope and innovation led by women as we developed the first community monoclonal antibody clinic in the state of Oregon that allowed for free access for all those who qualify for this life-saving therapy. In a matter of weeks, it was remarkable to watch a team of CNAs, LPNs, and RNs come together and build out in one week a healing community center for all Oregonians to receive free of charge in a trauma-informed healing environment. It was all hands on deck and when we got the approval and women who had already spent a year and a half working nights, weekends, long work days are now rapidly clearing out the gym, purchasing these incredible comfortable lazy boy chairs that were reclining to set up an infusion clinic with calm lights, healing music, reading, and a concierge style of therapy from entrance to exit, recognizing that every patient who was entering that facility was fearing hospitalization and death. This is a year and a half into a pandemic when people were exhausted. They were still thinking about the other person on the other side and how they felt. We served over 300 high-risk patients in just the first month alone, and even opened up the clinic on Christmas Day to ensure that the gift of life was available to all. Not because that was our role in healthcare, in the healthcare ecosystem, but because collectively we wanted to do more for our community and we had the knowledge and the desire to help others. And then there came Delta. Right, yeah, everybody remembers this wave. Our frontline workers in every setting were overtaxed despite vaccines. We still had a population of unvaccinated that brought us all to our knees. And once again, we collectively entered a new spring. Our governor, Kate Brown in Oregon, convened a special session of the hospital crisis wanting to learn, understand, and collectively come together to develop new models of care to meet the demand. Days, nights, and weekends were spent with women across the continuum, learning and leaning on one another on how we can work together to problem solve. 
We established a COVID response recovery unit throughout the state, mobile testing and vaccine clinics, and really focused a lot of energy on solutioning for staffing resources, which was already at the brink. And for many of you on the call, I know you live this every single day. During our time of crisis, the governor ensured that everyone had a seat at the table. All voices were listened to. And we look back and I see all these women who served on the front line and on the back line in the pandemic. They are creating our history. So next slide. So as we reflect back, why is it important to celebrate women and Women's History Month? It helps us see the whole story of our history and how we build a better future together. And even though the pots and pans are not banging at seven o'clock at night like they did for all the frontline staff at the beginning of the pandemic, let us as women continue to ring the bell for the women in our lives and our profession. We can create a better community together. We can build a future together. And takeaways that we have from this are some of the things that come to mind that I have here, and I'd like you to put in the, the chat um, things that you think are important in building uh, a better future for women, amplifying other women. When you hear somebody's voice and it's not being listened to, raise them up, echo their words, champion their initiative. Know your squad, it's so important to know who the people are around you that you can go to in a time of need. It doesn't necessarily have to be your boss or your direct reports when you're at work. It can be your girlfriend, it can be your neighbor, it can be your chaplain. Know who your squad are because these are the people who are there for you to lean on you. I think as women, we think we need to be at all for everyone. And I think it's also important that we know that it's important to seek and receive support. Stay connected to your values and what inspires you. And remember that one woman alone can have power, but collectively we can all have an impact. And what I witnessed coming into my organization, and I think for many of you, especially on the front line, live every day and that's the shine theory, right? When you help another woman rise, we will all shine together. So thank you. I want to. Thank you, um, April and Peace Health, for allowing me the opportunity to come and share my story today. And I'd love to hear from those on the call their story too. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Burns. That was that was great and inspirational. I actually love the shine theory. When you help another woman rise, we all shine, uh, which you know leads me to thank Crown um, as well. Our our women's uh, a caregiver affinity group um, who so uh, enthusiastically wanted to have you come as well and speak to us um, and share your stories, um, your heart, and your expertise. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Burns. I do have some questions and there were some chats that came in, some comments through the chats, but I'll jump to the questions. Um, or the question, okay, the questions, there's a couple of them. Um, you mentioned that the pandemic disproportionately impacted women due to lack of childcare. Yeah. I can personally say I understand that as a mom of a nine and a six year old. Uh, what do you say to women that as we try to get on the other side of this pandemic are trying to get back in the workforce? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that's one, one of many. Um, you know, areas of opportunity that was um, highlighted by the pandemic. I think championing in your work for more support for childcare resources, right? Childcare is not a decision, right? That people have the luxury of making. It is a financial impact that we all have. And the work in the workforce, employers, I would challenge employers to come to the table and solution for their employees by either additional funds for childcare, um, setting up centers for childcare, pulling women, right? Pulling the women who are experiencing this together into work groups on how to support them in the workforce when these um, challenges arise. Because we all know this is not going to be the last time we will be experiencing something like this in our lifetime. 
And as we talked about earlier, especially in healthcare, women predominantly, you know, are in the workforce in healthcare. And how do we keep women in the workforce? Um, we have to support them. That allows them to be a mother and a healthcare provider. No, thank you for that answer. I think, you know, even outside of healthcare, right? We need, we do need that support, but um, with the high numbers of women in healthcare, it's even, it's even more uh, urgent that we have uh, benefits that, that empower women to, to be both a healthcare uh, professional and a mother and a caregiver, right? And so, uh, but that's definitely been um, a, a huge discussion as we saw so many women, as you said, 60% lost income due to childcare. So many women had to leave the workforce. Um, I know personally just, you know, when homeschooling came down, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I am not called, called to this. Um, <laughs> I had to personally send emails and thank you cards to teachers for um, what they put up with for that many hours a day with my own children, who I'm, I actually love. So, you know, I just, you know, I, I my heart went out. Um, I received a lot of phone calls um, from women um, in my previous place of employment saying, you know, I'm going to have to quit. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to quit because they just couldn't make it work. So I'm always also encouraging um, um, leaders and, and managers uh, to be mindful of when they schedule meetings, things such as that, right? Like, you know, that was one of the uh, policies or um, practices that I that I advocated for and said, you know, this eight o'clock meeting, seven o'clock, 7.30 meeting in the, you know, when people are trying to get their kids to school, you know, and, and are trying to homeschool, do you have to do that, right? And there's some, and there's some cases you do, but when you don't have to, can you not do that? So people are not feeling this pressure and this unnecessary stress that makes them feel they have to choose between home and work. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And I would be curious for people on the call, um, you know, during the past two years, especially for those, um, you know, who are in a, a practice or who are in the hospital, did your leadership reach out? Did they ask for your engagement? Did they ask for your feedback? Because it really does. It starts from the fundamentals. Speaking to the people who are directly impacted to, pro to provide creative solutioning. I would just be curious, um, you know, if hospital systems and, and clinics uh, reached out to their employees. Yeah, no, I think that's good. Um, that's a, and I, I've only been here a little bit over a year, but I'm curious as well. That's a good question. How many times did they reach out? And you know, my hope with Crown, our uh, women's caregiver uh, affinity group that will be moving to resource group, um, is to be a resource um, for our organization so that they can get a pulse on uh, what uh, women need to be successful and feel supported. Right. here at work right and so um and you know it's uh, you know i'm always as, as a dei expert i'm always looking at generations as well like generations have different expectations to your point you know 50 percent of women in in uh are, are in medical school um, now and and and, uh, and so there's a different expectation of level of support generationally as well so things that i that certain generations put up with the new yeah. generations are like, we're not doing that, you know? And so I, I see that in all industries and, and organizations are trying to adjust. They're trying to adjust because what moves uh, previous generations not moving this generation the same way. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So it's, it's interesting. And, and the other complexity, you know, behind the child care issue is mm -hmm. that, you know, for many, when we're talking generational, you know, um, issues, many grandparents were the caregivers for children yet at the same time right they were also the age at most risk so where people may have had support before with, with mm -hmm. care and child care when the pandemic hit they could no longer have grandparents watching children because of the fear of what would happen and so covid really brought a you know a dynamic i don't think anybody could have ever predicted with the layers of complexity 
that happened, you know, speaking about, you know, how can employers help in some of our um, facilities at Avamir at the time, um, they actually had childcare on site, but because this was skilled care, senior living, mm -hmm. children could no longer come into the door. And so it impacted, you know, that that population of healthcare providers that already had an employer that had a solution in place, that that solution could no longer be because of the way that the virus presented itself. And so we really need to, you know, wrap our arms around this issue collectively, right? Every mm -hmm. organization, um, our country really needs to come together to figure out how to support families, just not women, families who mm -hmm. much health care. I am I am in total agreement with that. It's it's a family issue, you know, it really is. Um when we say families first, um th this is part of putting families first. And so um I, I am in total agreement with you. And I definitely can also relate, you know, same thing. Grand grand I'm in the sandwich generation. Younger kids, you know, parents older yeah. in the sense. During this time I lost my father. And so then you're trying to deal with, you know grieving as well as supporting a mother who's been married to someone for um you know for over 40 years and you're going okay so you're trying to figure all that out it, it's definitely been a daunting time so i will i'll move on um just with that because we have you know some of this has definitely manifested um we need to have self-care and, and take care of ourselves and how do we do that so um my question would be, um, as a frontline hero yourself, I'm curious how you uh, take care of your mental health and the advice you would give the community to deal with stress. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And one, I'll be honest with you, I, I still am challenged to figure out for myself, right? I think, especially as women, right? I think we're really good about giving advice to others and championing one another. And we tend to put ourselves on the back burner. Mm -hmm. um, I know during the pandemic, because of um, you know, the role in the community that I was in, mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't a lot of time to carve out you know, for your own personal well-being. And so the things that I would do for myself was ensuring that I spent time with my children that night. We sat down and I shared stories from the day of what we're seeing and where we're going, some of the challenges that we're having, even getting kid feedback from my kids, right? My kids who are at home, I have, you know, teenagers that are older. Um, but I think it was about having a sense of family, right? Because your family is what's helping you get through. All of my family live in New Mexico, so I didn't have any relatives here uh, with me, just me and, and, and my, my children. The other thing that I'd always try to do is at night when I get into bed, I make sure that I lay there quietly. I reflect back on the day. I think about the things that I'm grateful for, the opportunity that I have to play a role in the situation that we're in, the opportunity for my education. I did not come from a family uh, that had anybody in healthcare. My parents and I and my sister all went to college at the same time. And so I, I laid in bed at night reminding myself how grateful I was to be in the position that I was in. And so sometimes just, you know, having gratitude each day, especially when we don't have the luxury of time to get out and take care of ourselves, is something that helped me walk through the pandemic. And of course, relying on my squad that I talked about, um, you know, throughout the day, calling a couple people, even if it's for 30, 40 seconds, right? You just needed to debrief, you needed to, Hear something funny, you needed some uplifting advice, you know, having that squad, because to your point earlier when you and I were talking, April, we were not born to do this alone, right? So it's something that we, we always have to remember. There is always somebody out there who wants to be there for you. So don't forget to seek and accept that help. Yes. That is great. Yeah, we both said, you know, we're not meant to be independent, but yeah. interdependent. So, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I think we're going to just move to a new slide and uh, ask the audience. Yeah, and so this kind of ties back to a previous question, right? 
asking, you know, for those of you who are on the call, sharing your stories of hope and healing. Um, there are millions of stories, right? That everyone has and everybody has a very unique experience, something that touched them in different ways. And I think this would be a great time to hear, you know, various stories from the field. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's always, feel free to chat everyone in the <laughs> chat function. <laughs> That's always, feel like, and there are chats coming in, I think, you know, even to your earlier question about heroes. Um, and I have got some great responses. It takes a little bit um, longer to this functionality on this platform for whatever reason, but, you know, someone said from, from Brian, my mom, she wore herself out in life by taking care of everyone around her. So that was that was his his woman hero or his she his shero um, as I call it. Um, well Brian, thank you for joining the call and supporting yeah. and acknowledging your mom. It says a lot about you. It does. It does. It says a lot about him. Um, um, from Carolyn, when my mother-in-law died, we all thought she looked so awful. She was dazed from death, but the hospice nurse came in and told her and told her how pretty she was. I'll never forget how she beamed in pleasure at that moment in her life. Mm, that is so sweet. Someone else put my sister Carol as a retired nurse who cares for her husband, who has Lewy body dementia. She's so patient, just so kind and positive. So I am just, yeah, someone put, I, uh, I, there's, a, there actually have quite a few comments right now. My, um, my grandmother is the epitome of providing healing and promoting hope. As a nurse that's been 40 years as a missionary building clinics and schools all over the world, she touched so many lives and spent her days now uplifting her children and grandkids one way or another. Um, uh, first of all, I have another comment. Thank you, Dr. Burns. You've helped us to look inward and be proud of the work we've done. Sometimes it's easy to just do the job and not take the time to say, wow, we are touching lives. We don't do this often, but you've reminded us. Yeah, and so to your point, whoever whoever wrote that, that's, you know, you just made me think of something that we often, you know, talked about within, you know, our organization. And that is, again, being intentional every day, right? Because when you're going to work, you know how many patients you're seeing for those of you in the hospital. I mean, just a revolving door of high acuity all day long, navigating families, navigating patients, navigating your own personal lives. And when you're looking at your colleague, right, you really never know what's going on behind closed doors. And sometimes just a few words, simple words, like I really appreciated that you, and then really get specific and call out what you saw and acknowledge can really make a difference in someone's life. And it's really interesting to also get feedback and hear what people see that you might not even recognize. And when you do that, right, you start to spark a new trend, a new workplace practice, a new community among yourselves in your daily work. And so I appreciate that, that you just raised that issue uh, because that's something that we really try to be very intentional about and be authentic with. You know, I love that. I love that. Words, words matter. Yeah. You know, I like to see, you know, life and death are in the power of your tongue is a proverb. Um, and it's true. It, words will cheer you on and words can slow you down. So it's important to use that, those words as a positive uh, reinforcement and encouragement to those around you. Um, I like what you just said. You Can you repeat that, April? You said, Words can say that again. Words, <laughs> words can uh, cheer you on and encourage you. Or word, words can. Um, what did I say? I say slow something. Down. Down the words. You, you have down. to slow you down. There you go. I was going to say trip you <laughs> up, but slow you down. And and it's it's true, right? I mean, people. You know, I I work with leaders, and they forget mm -hmm. words matter. Yeah. I mean, people will stay in positions that are underpaid, understaffed, if they are getting the words of affirmations and encouragement they need, a little email here saying you did a great job. 
uh, you know, an acknowledgement of you did this and I've learned from you, right? As we're all learning and growing and that shows humility, right? And so, um, as my dad used to say, there's no big eyes and little use. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. you, you, when you can, when you're giving those words of affirmation, you're giving words of hope, you're giving words of strength, you're giving words of, of uh, perseverance. Yeah. So to your point, I, I love what you're saying, Dr. Burns. Um, I have another one. My direct supervisor always promotes hope for us. When we were shaken by the pandemic and were afraid of where it would take us, she never lost hope. She inspired us every day and still inspires us. Love that. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, and someone says, I have a squad like Dr. Burns, a group of women that wake up to kick butt and ask questions later. <laughs> <laughs> Can I join I you? Like, I know, all I'm thinking of is Charlie's Angels, right? <laughs> together, together, we are a force and we show love to each other every day. Um, women have that incredible ability. I know, um, and I'm looking at it, oh, from Mary Beth, I was going to go on to a, you know, just thinking about how women can just keep other women going, right? Even, a, even the way, I, you know, I am, I'm, married to a husband who sometimes I call him my coach. So <laughs> it's, it's, everything's a coach, you know, he played professional football, he played, you know, so everything becomes a speech about, yeah, dig in, do it. But sometimes you just need a woman to melt into <laughs> and then get the coach talk later, right? But I see something from Mary Beth, my coworker inspires me. We don't see each other often, but she always has a message of peace and tranquility. Mm. I love that. I love that, that, that calm energy sometimes. <laughs> That's right. And you know, I'm not I mean, your, your, <laughs> your, your prior, um, you know, comment that you made made me just remember, you know, Madeline Albright, who just recently passed away and, you know, don't, don't quote me on this, but one of her um, things that she used to say was there's a special place in heaven for women who, mm -hmm who acknowledge or champion or encourage, I don't remember the exact words, other women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having your squad of women around you really, really is incredibly important. And having a squad of women of diverse backgrounds, perspectives, and opinions, to me, is absolutely the best. It is the best. I think, you know, diversity um, is not just, you know, um, someone being a different gender than yourself. Um, sometimes it's diversity within your group, right? Within your right. gender group. And yeah. you want someone to give a different perspective. I know even culturally, sometimes I'm like, okay, how did you hear that versus what, you know, <laughs> what were they really saying? Because what I heard was this, right? And it, it just makes life richer. It makes you, um, I have someone in my, in my life that's, that it comes, from a farm, they're, 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 they will affectionately call themselves a farm girl. And so, you know, sometimes it's like, they have a tough, can be tough and say, play that, play your game, play your game when you get a little bit distracted, <laughs> play your game. And I appreciate that energy, right? And, and then I have other friends that have the kind of peace and zen and, you know, and, you know, let's go to the spa and, and you know, I need that energy as well. And so, their women are such a rich group, such a rich group, Agreed. such a rich group. Yeah. We, we, we can do anything and we can be anything and we can be there in so many ways, just our presence, our smile, our, you know, our words, you know, I like to say our smile is our ministry. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah it, is, it really is. I think that the mass, that's the hardest thing. Yeah. So you kind of had to learn how to smize as Tyra Banks called it. <laughs> You your next top model, I know. Next top model, and kind of make yourself inviting to people, but that that your smile gives hope. It gives. It shows that you recognize somebody, right. and we all just want to be recognized and loved. Do we want to be known, seen, and heard? That's right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much because we have one minute left, Dr. Burns, oh, and you. you. Yeah. They, thank you for your time. Um, you know, I just am, I'm just in awe of speaking to you today. You just have such a lovely presence and spirit. And we just thank you for the work 
you've done and you are doing in our communities and championing us and championing women. Um, and, and we just, we're rooting for you and we're grateful for you, Dr. Burns. Well, thank you. And back at the group on this call and to all the caregivers and frontline staff in this pandemic, whether you're male, female, however you identify, you truly have been an inspiration to the entire nation. And the gratitude that I feel on a daily basis for every one of you who come every day championing health, well-being, hope and healing to your patients, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.